bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite, or whatever the case may be. My name is Marcus, and I am the host of the Black Brazil Today YouTube channel, as well as the blackbraziltoday.com blog, where I analyze Brazil from the perspective of race. So as I've, uh, I've ventured back into this YouTube game for a little while now, after taking uh, an extended break, um, I'm just going through some of the material that I've posted over the years. Um, this, some of this material obviously is, uh, you know, several years old, but for people who aren't familiar with these stories, it's, you know, it's new material. You know, this article that I'm presenting today comes from April 3rd, 2015. So that's, uh, what about seven and a half years ago, but still, um, a lot of, um, intriguing events that have gone on in Brazil in the last few decades with the rise of this new, these new identity politics. Um, some people believe that much of these politics are d due to the implementation of the affirmative action system that started uh, sometime in the, like between 1999 and 2001. And a lot of people believe that this quota system, it sparked a conversation about race in Brazil that people just didn't usually have. And in the two decades since affirmative action has started, you've seen just this explosion of material about the issue of race because Brazil has always kind of silently, you know, swept racial issues under the rug as if they don't exist. But as I've said numerous times before, because of the advent of uh, social network, social media, uh, independent blogs where people, who had access to the internet could just go online and share their thoughts about whatever particular topic that they wanted to talk about. And with the rise of social networks, you know, the country as a whole could no longer just ignore what a lot of non-white Brazilians were saying, you know, before this conversation was kind of, uh, it was kind of restricted to, you know, universities. Um, we'll say mostly white scholars who were talking about the, the issue of race. You had, you know, European, American, Brazilian scholars who had been talking about the racial problems in Brazil since at least the 1940s. But what I really appreciated is be with the advent of social networks, blogs, et cetera, you got to hear from just everyday Brazilians about their thoughts of how Brazil deals with race, how it doesn't deal with it, um, how people are de in denial. Um, the lack of resources that people had to openly discuss these issues. And some of the things that I've seen over the last two, I, I almost feel like I was part of the whole thing because it just seems like somewhere in the late 90s to the early 2000s, this thing of discussing race openly and pushing back against the narrative that Brazil promoted itself as a racial democracy, it was just, it, it was amazing to see it. It was like... Um, I don't know if it's fair to say, but in some ways I feel like it's warranted that I could say that it seems like in about, you know, 50, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 years of the struggle in the United States, you know, coming from civil rights and black power. It seemed like because of social network, that structure, that struggle was like compacted into about a decade in Brazil in a decade, let's say 10 to 15 years. If we go back to say, I don't remember what year the social network called Orchid first came about. I remember when people first started telling me about it, like, Mark, you know, if you like the discussion of race in Brazil or whatever topic you might be into, Orchid is a place, a, a, a social network that you should check out. It was one of the first, you know, there, were or there was Orchid, you know, I think MySpace came along. Uh, eventually, Facebook came out and just wiped out Orchid, but before... Facebook took over as the dominant social network, this Orchid social network. It was huge in Brazil. It didn't really catch on that much in the U.S. But from what I remember, it was pretty big in Brazil and as, as well as in India. And, you know, I participated a little in Orchid, but I just like sitting back and reading what people were saying because it was like, it just seemed like so many Brazilians were so connected so uh they had invested so much of their emotional energy into pr projecting brazil as this racial democracy 
And then you get all of these non-white Brazilians stepping forward like, "Uh uh-uh, you know, this is my experience. This is what happened to me. You know, this is how my parents did not discuss this issue in the household. You know, this is what kids called me when I was in first and second grade. These were the racist things that my teacher used to say to me when we were in the classroom. So it was just, it was fascinating. You know, the the person who turned me on to Orca, they were absolutely right. It was like, once I jumped in, it was like, (laughs) you know, how people will post those memes of Michael Jackson at the movie theater in that thriller video. That was me. It was like, get a box of popcorn and just read some of the stuff that some of these people were saying. And how people were taking action to take this discussion online and throughout the country. So this piece that I want to talk about today, again, is from 2015. And it was an article that was inspired by uh, some black students at uh, Harvard University in the U.S., um, which led to black students at the University of Brasilia creating photographic campaign against racism. Now, this is uh, Universidade de Brasilia. Uh, University of Brasilia. Brasilia is uh, Brazil's, uh, the nation's capital, just like you have Washington, D.C., like District of Columbia. In Brasil, you have Brasilia DF or DF, uh, Distrito Federal, it's called. So the federal district, Brasilia Federal District is what it's called. It's a whole region, you know, basically the seat of uh, Brazil's federal government. Um, So This photographic campaign that went down at Harvard, it inspired this campaign by these students, black students at the University of Brasilia, and they took what they saw. uh, Let me see if it's still up. So I, too, am Harvard. It was a a campaign that we saw where black students at Harvard were just talking about, like, look, you know, I'm a part of this university, too. I guess this was back from 2014, if I'm not mistaken. But just the idea was people were taking these photos and posting them online in this campaign just to express how they were feeling. This girl here says, no, I will not teach you how to twerk. You know, the idea here is she's a black girl. She must know how to twerk, right? You know, this girl here says, uh, having an opinion does not make me an angry black woman. Or this one here, but then again, maybe I have something, maybe I have something to be mad about. So this was the campaign uh, that started at uh, Harvard University. And so people at the University of Brasilia picked up on this campaign um, it looks like this was from, I'm not sure if it was just black voices or it was from, uh, the now defunct Huffington post. And so they covered this story, an anti-racism campaign reveals the struggles of minorities on Brazil's college campuses. So this story got picked up. Um, I guess it was by black voices under the, uh, Huffington post banner. Um, and the campaign in Brazil at, at the university of the down temple, which basically means, you know, white people, you know, give me a break. Some people say white guy, white man, give me a break. But I would just say, you know, white people give me a break about some of the things that people would hear on a daily basis just based on the fact that they're black. Right. So I wanted to get a little bit into this because it was intriguing. These signs, they just get right to the heart of the matter, swears up and down. There's no racism there. Right. So this was, again, it's from 2015 when my blog was originally entitled Black Women of Brazil. I had to change that a few years ago for reasons I'll get into maybe in a future video. Um, So remember, this is from 2015. So for more than a decade now, the system of affirmative action at Brazil's top universities has provoked more discussion on the, the existence of racism and privilege in Brazil than perhaps any other time in the nation's history. The nation's 350-year experiment with human bondage ended nearly 127 years ago, but it didn't end the huge social and racial inequalities that continue to divide the country into rich and poor, white and black. So as this article was out in 2015, it says 127 years previously when slavery ended. So fast forward about seven years, we're talking about in 2022, it's been 134 years since the abolition of slavery in Brazil, Brazil having Uh, been the recipient of the most African people during the slave trade and also uh, the last nation in the Americas to abolish slavery uh, in 1888. So millions of white Brazilians and even some black Brazilians, or rather four millions of white Brazilians and even some black Brazilians, the misfortunes of the Afro-Brazilian population are their own fault. As even in the face of a documented history proving that this group was left to its own resources after abolition, with millions of European immigrants given government-sponsored privileges, everyday Brazilians continue to believe that 
no somos todos iguales, which means we are all equal. It, this is a phrase that I would often hear, or people would talk about this online, like in the face of like obvious racist incidents and attitudes, the reaction was always, we're always, we're all equal. There's no racism here. You know, what, whatever, no matter what color you are, we're all just equal. We're all just Brazilians. So it's campaigns like this and just hundreds other of others that just spoke to the fact that black Brazilians were no longer buying into the racial democracy a myth. Um, so when we, uh, in this part of the article that talks about millions of European immigrants giving government sponsored privileges, this is, um, Brazil brought between four to five million African Africans enslaved and working as free labor for like 350 years. And because the country was so overwhelmingly black and brown by the time the sla slavery ended in 1888, Brazilian elite said, we can't run or be, you know, uh, respected on the world stage with so many people of color in this country. So they came up with a program to uh, stimulate European immigration to the country. So they brought in four to five million Africans for free labor. And then afterward, somewhere between the late 19th, the late 19th century and the early 20th, the first half of the 20th century, they brought in maybe four to five European immigrants, almost the same number. Like, okay, that wasn't calculated, right? So this article from 2014 is talking about the ungrateful quota beneficiaries or when affirmative action in Brazil only benefited white immigrants. And it's just something that people don't like to deal with. It's like, OK, there's been this battle over uh, the constitutionality of the quota system. And it's always been the question of or the point coming from Afro-Brazilians like, OK, when Europeans came over here and they were sponsored by the Brazilian government, nobody said nothing. At that same time that all of these European immigrants were coming into Brazil, the Brazilian government imposed a law that says no more people from Africa or at the time Asia could come into the country. So it's like, okay, how do you, how are you complaining about, you know, black people getting quotas now or getting some type of privileges and advantages when in the late part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, it was European immigrants who were coming into the country fully subsidized by the government. As this picture says, subsidized by the government. Around 100 families of Italian farmers arrived in Pará, in southern Brazil, in 1898. You know, the Italian immigration uh, in that time period led to Brazil having like the largest uh, uh, country of Italian descendants outside of Italy. There's several of those little tags that you have there. Like they, Brazil is touted as having the largest population of black people or African descendants outside of Africa. Is touted as having the largest Japanese population outside of Japan. So this is just the whole point that, that, that this, you know, people were making. Like when the privileges are for black people, there's suddenly a problem. But when it's when it was for European white people, it, there wasn't a problem. So anyway, getting back to the point, uh, we're all equal. <laughs> really? So these are just some of the signs that some of these black students were holding up for this campaign. And they just represent some of the things that they would hear uh, from, from white Brazilians. You know, you'll see the lady here at the top here or the top left and her sign translated, it would say, wow, such an exotic beauty you have. Spare me. This one right here is saying, what does it say? What do you do to get your hair like that? Can I touch it? Uh, we got your, <laughs> this one right here, your Afro light as to say, okay, you're of African descendant and you're light skin, right? Then this girl is saying, do you wash your hair? I can't even, let me see if I can even, let me see. Uh, nossa, que beleza exótica você tem, me poppy. Right. Você Afro light. Uh, você lava seu cabelo. Okay. So <laughs> these are some of the things that people wrote on these signs talking about some of the things that they've heard. Just and people will say these type of things and look like, well, what's racist about that? <laughs> OK, continuing. Since the first few years of this century, the system of quotas has given Afro-Brazilians more access to education and employment than ever before in the nation's history. And historic white beneficiaries of higher education continue to lash out at the descend descendants of African slaves who they believe are unfairly stealing their places. Both blatant and subtle, racism that everyone denies is evidenced in the everyday comments that people make when confronted with the presence of persons they believe have no place being in certain places. 
And as a debate provoked by black militants at Brazil's top school, University of Sao Paulo, recently showed, the college campus is and will continue to be a place where black Brazilians will demand, will demand their rightful place in society. In another example, a group of university students in the nation's capital took the time to document some examples of Brazil's racism that doesn't exist. So again, this campaign translated, <laughs> it says, ah, white people, give me a break. So we see this first picture here and the girl sign translated, it says, Gigo, yo, he affirma, but say no suffer racismo. Okay, so it's saying, I say and reaffirm, you don't suffer racism. How many times have they called you macaco this week? Macaco, of course, meaning monkey. <laughs> like, you know, it's, I've said this in previous videos that, you know, monkey is one of Brazil's favorite terms for insulting persons of African descent. This photo essay is based and inspired by the photo campaign by black men and women students at the University of Harvard in the United States. You know, again, I, I too am Harvard, you know, it was a Tumblr page. Um, look at this girl sign. Uh, I'm not racist. I have black friends. <laughs> no, so I see the thing on amigos negros, right? I think everybody's heard that one time or another. Um, let me see. The idea was to reproduce the experience at the University of Brasilia in the nation's capital. So this guy's holding a sign where he says, he's heard people say, you're not black. You're a light skinned moreno. You know, these are some things that he's, he's heard from, you know, acquaintances. And this is something that you, you, you would hear this in Brazil just all the time. I, I did a previous video that was saying that in some families, they love when you have a relationship that goes across color lines and you have a black partner and a white partner. I was one of the studies was talking about how these families may love the black people in their family, but in order for them to accept them, they could not affirm that they were actually black. So they would use terms like, no, 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 he's not black. He's Moreno, right? Again, this term Moreno, which can mean almost anybody, black or white, as long, if they don't have blonde and red hair, you know, any, almost anybody in Brazil can be a, a, a Moreno. Be they um, clearly black, light-skinned black person, um, someone of mixed race, a white person with a tan, a white person with dark hair, anybody can be a Moreno. And so th this is something I've talked much about, like they'll deny a person being black, like, well, you're not really black, you know, you're a little bit dark, you know, you're a Moreno, you're a mulatto, you're mestizo, whatever it might be. And for years, it wasn't a problem. But then somewhere along the line, black Brazilians started demanding their black identity. Some people were invited to participate in the photo shoot. However, the vast majority of people were chosen random, randomly in places like the university restaurant, ICC, and other busy locations of the University of Brasilia. So looking at this girl sign, she says, these, these are, okay, again, these are things that they've heard other people say to them. Ah, these quota students, they come here in the Department of Law without knowing how to even read or write. <laughs> like, really, they got into law school without being able to read and write. Okay. First, I thank the avail availability of all people who somehow contributed to this photo shoot. Thank you. The help of each of you was priceless. Okay, so this is a person who's documenting the campaign, probably had some part in creating the campaign. So this girl is holding a sign. Now, how can I translate this without using any vulgar language? Basically, what they're saying is that this girl is only for, mm, we'll say, fornication. She's not for marrying. And this is um, refers to the popular saying that says in Brazil, you have the saying that translated, it says white women are for marriage, mulatto women are for fornication or sex or the F word if you, if you prefer, and black women are for work. So in this one phrase, you see when you include the mulatto woman as just being a, a black woman, then you see that black women are valued in a society only for sex and work. So this is what this woman has probably heard at once upon a time. You know, she's not for marrying. She's not for putting a ring on it. She's just for laying down with, right? It's something that a, a, a lot of people have complained about this. Um, I would like to give special thanks to the great Leonardo Ortego, Ortega for having made his camera lens and accessories available for the work to be carried out with the equality it deserves. So then this one, this one is intriguing. Uh, she says she's her. You don't look black. You don't have those black features. <laughs> really? 
what's that all about? I mean, that's clearly a black girl to me. Finally, I want to thank Abayomi Mandela, a dear uh, fellow companion for any and all help and support, technical and emotional. So this girl, what we'll say, Fias Fakodaji Mora in Periferia, you're going to college and you live in the periphery. So this is a stab at anybody who comes from poor neighborhoods in Brazil. It's like, how did you get into college? This, you know, it's almost a lot of black students feel this way when they enter into the university and they see that they're surrounded by people who are either just white or what we call Brazilian white, the type of people where they'll be they'll be accepted as white in Brazil. But if they leave the country and go to other countries where people are more, we'll say, closer to purely white. Um, but yet they'll adapt, they'll adapt the ideology of being white. And so when black students come onto the university settings, they see just how outnumbered they are. And the comments and the reactions of the people on the campus make them feel like they don't belong on the campus. So this is what is in this comment. It's like, you're going to college and you're from, you know, the periphery, they call it the suburbs. And in Brazil, when they say something is from the suburbial. It's saying you're from the poor neighborhood because in Brazil, the, the surrounding suburbs are the poor regions, like in the hills of, of major cities, whereas the, the central part of the city is where you're you're considered to be more part of everyday life, middle class neighborhoods, even lower class. But if you're living in the periferia, particularly in favelas, you're considered to be someone who's very poor. So first of all, just assuming that this girl is from a favela or the perif periferia, the periphery, that's racist in itself. It's saying, oh, you don't even know where this woman is from unless she opened her mouth and says, yes, I'm from the periphery, you know, the periferia. Um, so the Tumblr, A Branco Down Temple, is intended for people who argue even today about the non-existence of racism inside and outside of the university. So this woman is holding the sign that says, para uma negra, você é até bonita, which means for a black woman, you're even pretty. Again, this idea that if you are black, or better yet, if you're beautiful or you're pretty, then you cannot be black. It's, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's an old phrase that people will hear all the time. It's like, because of the stigma attached to blackness, it's automatically assumed that somebody is black. They must automatically be unattractive or ugly. So then if she's black and she's attractive, or they will take the identity from that person to remove them from the black category because labeling somebody as black, it's a, it's a contradiction in the minds of some people. Like she can't be black and beautiful at the same time. So although in Brazil, there are no laws of a racist nature in social practice, it's still recurring. Now this points to the fact that Brazil never had this segregation legally uh, sanctioned segregation where it's like whites only, blacks only over a water fountain, you know. But in the social interactions between people, it's socially respected. It's like um, nobody's going to tell this person you're not supposed to. Well, sometimes people do. There's a lot of articles I've, I've produced and, and edited on this topic. Like, you know, people make snide comments like, oh my God, what are they doing here? You know, uh, if you see black people at a, one of Rio's top most beautiful beaches or you see them 30,000 feet in an airplane people you know or going to a car dealership people automatically look like well, what are they doing here they're not supposed to be here so this is what i'm saying they don't have explicit laws they've never had really explicit laws even though we've seen several examples of how this type of segregation existed in brazil even without the signs it was just kind of like kind of like socially accepted so no laws of a racist nature, but in social practice, this stuff still goes on. And these, the signs that these people are saying are showing are kind of like a proof that you don't, you don't need any racist signs of legally sanctioned segregation because it's in the attitudes of the people. So then what is this girl saying? You're a pretty black woman because you have a thin nose. Everyday black students in Brazilian universities suffer hidden discrimination that stereotypes them. Okay, so what is she saying? It says, I said Morena, because if I would have said black, you have you would have been embarrassed. Now, this is something really key because sometime in the late 90s to the early 2000s, with the rise of this militancy, it went it, the the everyday uh ideals went from first 
if you don't want to offend somebody, don't call them black. Don't refer to them as negro or preto, right? But then as this rate, as these racial politics started to change, people started demanding like, no, 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 no. Don't call me with any other moniker, morena, mulata. Call me black. So this is what this woman's sign is talking about. It's like, you know, I'm going to call you morena because you'll probably be embarrassed if I called you black. And you go back to the 80s and 90s, that's probably what the social, uh, how can we say, that was a social standard. But nowadays, people want to clearly affirm like, no, 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 don't call me that. You know, call me what I am. I'm black. Although the vision of those who practice the acts are just a joke, an observation, an attempt to help. For those who suffer it every day, it's like a wound that still hasn't healed. So this woman's sign says, where did those green eyes come from? I hope that the statements expressed in images sensitized cause reflection and engage in a dialogue in order that we become better people. So this guy's sign is saying, I didn't know that people like you had a sensibility for architecture. <laughs> so these are comments that he would hear from his colleagues at work. Continuing, uh, what do you do to wash this hair? <laughs> no racism there right um student produced series of photographs for the discipline of visual anthropology she took photos of blacks on campus citing the most heard racist phrases racism doesn't exist remove this thing from your head right <laughs> That's actually kind of funny some of these signs um the project of a student at the university of brasilia to provoke Debate on racism at the university earned at least a thousand followers on the internet 10 days after its release. So this guy's sign says, Você nem parece negro. You don't even look black. You know, and this is another way of creating this confusion for people who don't, who are not very dark skinned and who don't have very coarse, curly, kinky hair to remove their identity. Like, what are you thinking about? You're not even black. So, oh, white people, give me a break. The site publishes photos taken of black men and, and women at this, of students at the University of Brasilia showing racist phrases they most often hear. So this one says, don't even study. <laughs> they, how do they want quotas? So they're saying, you know, you people don't even, you don't even bother to study. So, you know, how is it that you're asking for quotas, right? They're assuming that persons of African descent, this was one of the main arguments when the quota system was being introduced there, like they would say that black and poor students coming to the university setting would actually diminish or lower the quality of a college education by lowering the standards. And years later, they would, dis they would find studies which show that the students that were coming in through affirmative action policies were doing as well. And in some cases better than the students who, you know, who got in just through passing the, uh, the college exam without the quota. So, that argument, argument kind of flies when you compare it to, to the research that's being done. Um, let me see. I wanted to. This, is, um, this was an article that was just talking about how affirmative action in Brazil worked out so greatly because so many students, it just proved all they needed was an opportunity to be able to go to college. You know, this is, um, in our, I can't remember what year this magazine article came out. It's from uh, Ish2A magazine. You know, Brazil has its own type of news journals, you know, you have Time and Newsweek in the, Time and Newsweek in, Newsweek in the U.S. and there you have Veja and Ishtue, this magazine here. And this is basically saying why the quotas worked out. Okay, um, let's see. Released on the internet on March 19th, again, back in 2015, the blog has earned nearly a thousand followers as of Sunday night, the 29th, according to the author of the project, Lorena Monique dos Santos. Okay, so this guy's, he's got on a Toronto Raptors jersey, you know, NBA <laughs> jerseys are popular everywhere. Uh, I just remember being in Uruguay and I saw some African immigrants wearing NBA, NBA jerseys walking around in Montevideo. Anyway, his sign says, light skin Moreno is not an evolutionary stage. Okay. According to the young woman who's 21, and is currently in the fifth semester of social sciences, the goal of the project is to demonstrate that racism in Brazil is something subtle. And I've always reacted to that because sometimes it is subtle. Sometimes it's just extremely blatant. So I don't think people should keep going around talking about how subtle it is. 
you know, I could go into several articles that just show how blatant it is as well. So this sign, I say, no concordo com as cotas na real, só eles que separam. I don't agree with quotas on the real. They are what separates us. You know, this was, this is another argument that people would make against the system of, of, uh, of, of, affir of affirmative action, saying that, you know, you creating quotas for people who are non-white, and that's, that's a way of, of separating people. But they never argued when you would go into so many areas or look at certain job positions and you would see only white people. So, no, you never had signs that segregated, but socially, really, Brazil has always been segregated. When you go into the poor communities, you're going to have an overwhelmingly uh, black and brown population there. You don't need signs to segregate people. Okay. Um, although racism is racism everywhere, it is expressed in different ways according to each situation. So this guy's sign says, we'll say no negro, meaning you're not black. Again, this idea of stripping away somebody's uh, identity. In Brazil, there's a thing of cordiality of the racial democracy that are ways to hide the racist practices and try to make it so that black persons are excluded access to rights and to certain social positions, positions, she told the G1 website. This guy signed, let me see if I can read this. We'll say things sorti eat say negro. Name what name precisa estudar para passar no vestibular. So he's saying. You're lucky being black. You don't even have to study to pass the college ex <laughs> college ex uh, ex entrance exam, basically saying, oh, you're getting in on quotas. So you don't need to study. Hey, OK, there's been several documented uh, research that just shows that just because a person gets into the university, it doesn't mean that they're able to stay there. So it's one thing that the quotas do get you into the university, but staying there is going to be worth. It's going to be based on your ability to be able to keep up with the, the schoolwork. Okay, the idea is to demonstrate to non-black people that racism is hidden and it's hidden in its subtle words and acts. Although in some photos, we can see that it's not so, it's in a not so subtle way, she explained, which is the point that I just made. It's not always subtle racism. Sometimes it's quite blatant. Let's say this is a very <laughs> common um, uh, phrase that you hear. I don't know if you hear it a lot now, but it's part of Brazil's history. The same way, some people will call somebody and say, you act white or, you know, you're an Oreo cookie in the United States. Speaking of black people who in some type of ways, through their mannerisms, the way they speak, the things that they like and people or their political slant, you know, which may be more conservative or whatever, black people will be labeled as Oreo cookies. In Brazil, they call this a person with a white, a black with a white soul. All right. So this is what this guy's sign says here. Um, until Monday night, the 30th, the site had more than 60 images recorded in various parts of the campus of University of Brasilia. They show students holding a whiteboard, always with the phrase chosen by them. So it says, uh, let me see. Do you use powder makeup or charcoal? <laughs> what is that all about? Um, prejudice inside and outside of college. Uh, pull cable say no. <laughs> so they're asking, why don't you comb your hair? Yeah, okay, nothing wrong with that, right? Daniela Leite, a history student at the University of Brasilia, says she suffered from a phrase that denied her Black condition since childhood within her family. You're lucky being Black. You don't even have to study to pass the entrance exam. You know, it's pretty similar to the other sign that we saw a little bit earlier here. I entered through quotas and heard that phrase again. A friend said this to me that when I took the bit... A friend said that to me when I took the, the, the vestibular, again, the uh, college entrance exam. Okay, so his sign. What's up, brother? Do you have seda, <laughs> which is a shampoo, a, a brand of shampoo and conditioner in Brazil? So basically, he, they're asking, uh, do you wash your hair? Really, that's what, he, what they're trying to say. She thinks, she thinks that I only opted for quotas because it was, it was easier, she said to the G1 website. Uh, você privilegiada por ser cotista. You're privileged because you're a quota student. Okay. Estefani Alves, 23, is a geology student at the University of Brasilia and also participated in the project. This guy's sign says, My name is not Negão. My name is Bernardo. Okay. Negão meaning you could say big black man or straight up black man. It's a very common uh, term. Uh, when addressing black men in Brazil. And uh, 
in some ways, people are starting to take that almost as a racist term, right? She was photographed on the campus of the institution holding the board with the phrase, Você tem sorte em ser negra, nem precisa estudar para passar no vestibular. You're lucky to be black. You don't even need to study to pass the entrance exam. Okay. I'm not Ellen Oleria. For, for you, are all black women the same? Now, oh, uh, Ellen Oleria, I'm going to see if, uh, see where this link takes me. The, uh, I talked a little bit about Ellen Oleria is. A uh, singer musician, I think she might. And Ellen Oledia, the overweight black lesbian Afro rock. Wow, it's it's. I remember this like it was yesterday. It was a huge deal when this woman won the the music reality show. You know, Brazil's edition of The Voice. So, in the uh, the article that I'm talking about right now, or that I'm reading right now, this is what um people have said to this young woman. It's like, oh, um, but, well, she's responding. No, I'm not Ellen Oledia. So, and she's asking, okay, so for you, do all black women look alike? I closed this phrase because, or I chose this phrase because it's quite commonplace in the middle of the university, especially here at the University of Brasilia where the quota system is accepted, she said. This sign, I always wanted to know what a black woman's like in bed. Yeah, that's, even if people don't say this, it's a pretty common thought. Um, I put up a video some weeks ago, this recent uh this recent um this situation that this young black model um experienced i think she was at a luxury hotel and this uh this one of the white guests of the hotel started sending over one of the uh one of the hotel employees telling the employee to go over and send messages over to this black woman that he was apparently attracted to he kept sending a waiter over there or you know the employee and you know, the woman was like, you know, I got a boyfriend, you know, why is he harassing me this way? Finally, the guy, he was clearly an older, older white man. He just felt it. He felt comfortable enough to walk up to this black woman and ask her, like, look, baby, I want to be with you tonight. Like, how much does it cost? I pay you anything. I'm rich. And she was just like totally offended. She was shocked that this guy stepped to her that way. But as the phrase says, it, I've said it, you know, again, white woman for marriage, mulatto woman for sex black women for work. So the stigma associated with black women for centuries now is that they're good for work and sex. So then this is what this woman's sign is talking about. Like, I've always wanted to know what a black woman's like in bed, <laughs> right? Continuing, another project participant is Mateos Henyiki Hamos, a math student who chose a phrase related to his hair. It's a recurring question they ask me. It must be hard for you to work and study, says this sign. They always associate black power hair to poor hygiene, care, carelessness, not even seeking to know how much work it is to maintain the hair like this. Little do they know how much care must be taken, he says, believing that people have a preformed concept of cabello crespo, which means kinky curly hair, outside of the standard imposition, which is short. A lot going on here. First of all, the Afro in Brazil is, is known as a black power. They adapted the actual English term to define when someone has a, a large natural Afro, because the, the thing is they associate, you know, Afros with 1970s United States. When you saw people like Angela Davis, the Jackson five, uh, who else? You know, like the, um, what was the name of that family group? The Silvers, they had these enormous Afros and they associate that with the Black Panthers you know, with the fist in the air. So when they, uh, in Brazil, uh, uh, when, when they call it, they call it an Afro, they refer to it as a black power and actually, and they use the English term. Or sometimes they just say black, you'll go also say black. I, mean, I like your Afro, they would say, right? Um, then talking about this preformed concept of Cabello Crespo or kinky curly hair outside of the standard imposition, which is short. Um, this is just saying that for years, black men in Brazil were not allowed to wear large afros because it was considered you know really bad hair it's like how can you walk around with your hair like that so black men would take to just shaving their hair as close to the scalp as possible to avoid being harassed for walking around with quote unquote nappy hair right notice this guy has on a malcolm x t-shirt says i didn't know that in law there were people like you i think that says it all um there's articles that i have on the blog that talk about 
in the college and the universities in Brazil, some of the more prestigious courses will be medicine and law. And people are not expecting to see non-white people in those areas. They're expected to see, you know, black and brown Brazilians in courses like, you know, sociology or something. So basically that point is saying like, you know, you're in law school. What are you doing here? You're black. Uh, interpret it as you will. But that's basically what, what that phrase is saying. A lot of black students complain about being the only black people in certain uh, disciplines, you know, and they'll be the, the subject of these type of comments. Um, University, of Brazil, was, University of Brasilia was the first federal university to have racial quotas. Quota students such as uh, Stephanie Alves say that they suffer prejudice because of this. You know, people find out that you're on the quota system and, you know, they make really off the cuff comments. So again, this uh, campaign was inspired from, by Harvard. Look at this girl's sign. We'll say no way negative. We'll say Morenina. You're not black. You know, you're a little Morena girl, right? Again, okay, she, she's not the darkest person. She's not, she doesn't have the darkest color in the crayon box, but she identifies as black. But people around her would tell her, no, 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 you're not black. You're Morena. You're Morenina. Again, trying to strip away her black identity. Lorena, the creator of the blog, explains that the idea, the blog idea came from, uh, came in 2014 from videos that she saw produced and published on YouTube and a similar project done by students at Harvard University in the United States that also debates inclusion and diversity on the campus. Okay, this woman's sign says, my name is not Nega, Neguinho, or Morenina. My name is Lujimila, all right? So even though for many years people would say these type of terms are terms of, infect, of affection, increasingly Black women and Black men don't want to hear these type of terms, you know, Nega, Neguinho. And then I just discussed Morenina, you know, people would say Nega and Neguinho are terms of, 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 of affection, but in the same way, in some ways that the N-word works in the United States where one black person calls another black person with the N-word and it's, you know, it's rather, it's kind of acceptable. But if a white person does it, it's unacceptable. In some ways, nega, neguinha, these type of uh, terminologies work similarly in Brazil, depending on the relationship between the two people who use the term. Okay. At the same time, she did a course in visual anthropology and decided to put the project into practice as the final work of the course. So it says, uh, Nega do cabelo duro passa um alisante que ajuda a melhorar. So hard haired black woman, put some straightening product in your hair that will help make it better. Uh, okay, again, the uh, idea that she has bad hair. The photos were taken in November during Brazil's week of con black consciousness. Again, November Brazil is kind of like Black History Month, they call it Black Consciousness Month. Um, let me see. Again, this another sign. No, it was, no so racista. Tenho, tenho até amigos negros. I'm not racist. I even have black friends. I handed out the whiteboard and the brush so that people could write their phrases. To help them uh, make a list with about 20 phrases similar to Harvard, the Harvard Project uh, phrases. Some people use the list of the phrases, but the vast majority wrote their own phrases, she recalls. Uh, we'll say, Lava Sel Cabello, do you wash your hair again? You know, he has an afro, so his hair must be nasty. That's what this idea is. Most sentences concern prejudices heard at the university that quota students don't need to study to pass the entrance exam. There are phrases related to skin color, facial features, and hair type of each student. I can't even read what that says. It says, Blacks themselves are racist against themselves, which has been a, a common argument for a long time. Like uh, black people who grow up with the lack of pride in being black and how they carry themselves, people will say, well, you're black and you don't like black people. You don't even like yourself. Um, your features are fine and your skin is not so dark. Such an exotic beauty that you have, such different hair, can I touch it, are some of the phrases that make up the project. Você não precisa de quotas, não? Né? You didn't need quotas, right? Now I'm organizing a video on the mini doc format to present a discussion on the subject, says Lorena. It says, I'm against quotas and in favor of meritocracy, which another uh, one of the most common arguments against quotas that says, you know, earn your way into the university, which, and, and actually I'm not arguing against that, but when we look against, when we look and see the opportunities that people from 
more well-off families are able to um, invest their money in the education of the child to prepare them for the college, a very difficult college entrance exam. Whereas the kids that come from poor neighborhoods, their families don't have the resources to be able to prepare them in a private school that's usually expensive. This, you know, this, this goes on and on, but this has been one of the main arguments for people to try to overturn a quota system. Um, Mateos Hiniki Ramos, Ramos, a student at University of Brasilia also allowed himself to be photographed for the project. Okay, so the University of Brasilia uh, reduced the racial quota in 2014. So negro se que presença te incomoda. He says, I'm black. I know my presence bothers you. A lot of articles I've done on that, as I've said. It, certain areas of society, white Brazilians just feel like they have just the right to be there. And it's only supposed to be people who look like them. So that's what he's saying. Like, I know I'm in a university and just me being here really bothers you. And that that's come out over the years. Um, the University of Brasilia is a pioneer in affirmative action policies in Brazil. The University of Brasilia adopted the system of racial quotas in 2003 after a case of discrimination in a graduate school gained notoriety. That's the same picture here. The first entrance exam with 20% of reservation of seats or places for black students was held in June of 2004. At the time, it was decided that the system would be rediscussed in 10 years. What an interesting color you have. Discrimination has always existed. The difference is that before the quotas, uh, one didn't talk about it and black people were outside of the universities. Today, there is a considerable number of black people in universities and some of these people try to establish a frank and open discussion about it, said the student. And that's what I said, you know, in the beginning of this video. Um, what is this? I'm not prejudiced. My maid is black and everyone loves her. <laughs> this is another uh, intriguing point uh, in Brazil where you have a, a lot of families that have maids in the house. A lot of the homes will have like a, the maid's quarters, the place where the maid is supposed to sleep. And people will say, oh, she's like one of the family, but they exploit this woman and exploit her work. They try to pay her as cheap wages as they can. They don't want to give her vacation, but then they want to call her. She's like one of the family. <clears throat> Long history of uh, how maids are treated in Brazil, but that's another topic. In April 2004, the University of Brasilia decided to reduce the reservation of vacancies for blacks to 5%. Among the arguments is the fact that the federal quota law, which provides 50% of jobs uh, saved for students coming from the public network, would incre increase this percentage of 5%. This guy's sign says, I'm not a descendant of slaves. I'm a descendant of human beings that were enslaved. Okay. Even with the experience in the University of Brasilia, uh, even as it has lasted more than 10 years, Lenina says the debate needs to be further encouraged. There is still much resistance. Whenever we try to talk about it, the first reaction is to say that Black people are victimistas. They're playing the victim, she said. More or less is the place you come from. Brazil is good. I don't know where is that. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. More or less is the place where you can hear mais ou menos. Okay. <laughs> she affirms that the impact of her project has been positive, even if there is a disagreement as to the format and the chosen name. Some people agree, others disagree, but we discuss the subject. Silence is something terrifying. Hearing these phrases and imagining what this is all, what, how this is all in the mind is maddening. So this just, uh, you know, it's just uh, uh, an example, a microcosm of the type of things that people hear every day. And it just, I mean, just imagine some of these phrases were just absurd. Like you had the nerve to walk up to somebody and say something like this, right? So, but that's, these are the type of things that I just wanted to expose when I first created this blog in 2011, because, you know, nobody would, would believe that these types of things happen in Brazil. It's like, you know, we mix freely, you know, uh, I got black people in my family, I got black friends, you know, this type of thing. But <laughs> when people say what they really mean, these are the signs that come out, you know, the, the, remember what the article said is a lot of these people, instead of just taking the signs that were pre-created. They scribble phrases that they, they themselves have heard, and it makes this a whole lot more personal. So anyway, just another experience of what, uh, what the Black experience in Brazil. So I'm going to cut the video here. I think I've said enough. 
But just curious to know, you know, what did you think about this article? What did you think about some of these phrases? Some of the com- how would you react if somebody said these things to you, you know, as if it was no problem? You know, drop a comment in the comment section. Consider subscribing to the channel. Um, you know, share these videos. This is definitely a discussion that needs to take place because I still think that most people don't understand the racial dynamics that go on in everyday Brazil. And um, consider subscribing to the channel if you like this video or some previous videos. And um, I'm going to I'm going to try to keep pumping them out. So with that said, uh, that's going to conclude this video. And I hope to see you guys check out my next video.